I have a, a funny little story to tell about John Orham. Uh, he he uh, was very, when he went to DeMent's lab, he realized that there were active processes that were involved in falling asleep. And he uh, was very interested in uh, the control of the nicotinating membrane in cats and because it, it rises and uh, before non-REM sleep or falls, I don't know which direction it goes in. And uh, he uh, started, so he figured out record facial motor neurons and he kept running into respiratory modulated units that dropped out during sleep. And he went with, to Bill DeMet sort of in disgust, you know, this is my, these are the data that I'm gathering. And, and uh, Bill DeMet got all excited because sleep apnea had, had been described in 1966 formally. Um, although there's a recording of Bill Cosby doing a, the uncle, some uncle who had horrendous snoring in the early 60s. Anyways, uh, the bottom line is uh, that's how he became a respiratory neurophysiologist is, is recording. So it, it really is uh, phenomenal what he did. Okay, so I got to go back one, I suppose. So I'm going to talk about respiratory rhythm genesis. And there are two distinct uh, well, not so distinct, but you can, there's a continuum of thought about how respiratory uh, rhythm is generated. And uh, you'll hear about the pre-Betzinger complex in this talk, and you'll also hear about the network. And I'll try to synthesize this I, and um, uh, in a way that it will fit in the middle of the continuum. It's a, it may not be a uh, judicious to do it this way. I should take one side or the other, but try to meld these two uh, theories. So one is sort of a endogenous pacemaker theory of the pre-Betzinger complex. And uh, it, it really says that the rhythm uh, originates there and emanates not only uh, in the respiratory network, but also it's evident in many rhythms in the uh, central nervous system the basic uh, uh, rhythm. And the other one is a very much uh, what I prefer the, is the network that incorporates the pre-Betzinger complex and show, shows that the pre-Betzinger complex is uh, very important for generation of the rhythm, but it is uh, rarely, it doesn't stand alone. So, um, so the goals should be familiar with uh, at the end of this talk is uh, the brainstem regions to generate the respiratory rhythm, uh, skeletal striated uh, muscles execute the respiratory behavior. I, I just had to put this in because too many people think it respiration is an autonomic function and, and it's automatic, but it's not autonomic. And it's automatic because there's central pattern generator. Uh, Autonomic system by definition acts via smooth muscles and uh, cardiac uh, muscles. And uh, uh, in contrast, but uh, respiration acts through somatic uh, or skeletal muscle and striated muscle. So it's part of the somatic motor function. And it is interesting that the cardiorespiratory system is coupled uh, and acts to deliver oxygen to the tissue. So is this? could be just like everything in my mind is an artificial divide uh, between these two control systems. But nevertheless, uh, it's not considered, uh, respiration is not considered to be an uh, autonomic behavior. And then um, the other thing I really want to emphasize is that intrinsic and extrinsic properties uh, determine neural activity. What do I mean by that? Uh, pacemaker-like or endogenous bursting-like rhythms are an intrinsic property of the cells that are that express them, whereas uh, extrinsic properties are the network uh, are the neural connections that uh, neurons make in a network, and so that's essentially uh, the two uh, opposing poles in the control of respiration: the uh, pacemaker versus the network circuit. But the pacemaker is an oversimplification, even by the people that uh, study the uh, pre-Betzinger neurons. I love these slides, the next series of slides, because there are uh, they are the best at showing where the brainstem is in the body, and um, 
uh, Richard Silver gave me uh, or uh, pointed me into this direction of slides, and it's it's uh, it, it's fascinating that the respiratory uh, control system lives in God. I, I I love that. I love the fact that. So this is his vision of God, and this is the brainstem, right? <laughs> it's like unbelievable the ventral or the anterior surface in in her. In humans, but I work mostly on animals, and this looks exactly like the ventral surface of the brainstem, or the anterior surface of the brainstem. And this is the fourth panel, or D down here, the blown up. And then uh, this is a, a blow up of the uh, of that panel showing the surface there. This is the anatomical uh, preserved uh, cortex and brainstem and uh, our upper central nervous system. And then it, this is uh, the outline of the structures that are uh, visible here. I wish they almost should, they're highly visible here. They should outline them here is what I think, but in the cadaver, but and that's neither here nor there. Um, and then uh, he's showing why he thinks this is so important because uh, that this author thought that the light here is shining on, on God's gown, but there's another source of light that's shining on God's brainstem. Uh, I, I think, and I think it's it's wonderful to think that God has a brainstem. And then this is the vascular turn nature of this thing, and this is very important for the central control uh, uh, chemoreceptors, which um, are uh, in, in located in the ventral uh, brainstem. Um, many cells in the central nervous system are sensitive to changes in CO2 or pH, and uh, the the uh, but there are groups of cells in the ventral brainstem that are highly sensitive and, and selective for these changes. And um, we, I mean, I'm a neurocentric person, so I tend to focus on the neurons that are involved. But there are also glia down here that seem to have sensitivity, and glia release uh, glutamine. So uh, there, the, the, this, this vasculature is not showing the basal artery, and their basal artery is going right up the middle, and it uh, innervates, um, innervates. It perfuses uh, the raffe and the area right around the facial nucleus, uh, which is called the parafacial group. Okay, so those are where the central chemoreceptors for CO2 or pH uh, live. And the, 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 uh, you, we'll talk about the raffe neurons. Raffe means midline, or I don't know what it means in French, but I was told it means uh, midline. So um, uh, they, the, the raffe are concentrated along the midline, but they also spread out uh, laterally. And then finally, this is the uh, cervical uh, spinal cord that originates of the phrenic nerve, and um, uh, the phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm imaging nerve, main inspiratory uh, motor nerve. So this is uh, a, a, I usually start out with Neil Turniak's uh, box diagram with the control of respiration, and uh, it's a, a focuses on uh, a very simple um, model that is understandable. It doesn't immerse you into this uh, craziness here, but it composed, it's composed of a controller, a plant, which is essentially the uh, lung and airway and pumping muscles and the valvular uh, skeletal muscles. And then um, uh, the controlled variables, which is, is essentially blood gases. This is sort of saying that this system is highly coupled. And I would argue that uh, that my uh, ideas that around this uh, controlled system is that there are two, the central nervous system compares two sensory inputs uh, from the, uh, uh, related to the plant and the function of respiration. The first one is uh, efferent's copy, which feeds directly back into the uh, pattern. Uh, efferent's copy example it was described in 1853. Uh, that's, that's uh, yeah, you heard me right, 150 years, 170 years ago almost now, and uh, by von Helmholtz. And he, he um, 
described, he identified that there must be efferent copy because when you um, move your eyes in smooth pursuit, your, your visual field is changing, it, uh, but yet it doesn't change as how you perceive it. You can uh, move your eyes and visual field will stay uh, static in your brain, but you, you know it's changing across the retina. And uh, the, the, in contrast to if you take your finger and move your eyes, not using your ocular muscles, but rather using your finger, you can see the shift in the visual field. And so he said there must be a, a copy of the motor um, signal that allows the, the visual cortex to maintain the, the stability of the visual field. And that's a tremendous insight. Uh, and um, so that's what efferent copy is, and that's sort of the copy of the motor signal. For the ocular muscles, as you know, there's no load. I mean, the eyeball is essentially very little load, but it, it applies to other systems. And um, uh, locomotion has a, a similar concept as well. Central pattern generators then sort of uh, need the etherics copy. And then the central nervous system will compare what's happening to Is it okay if I put it? And, and uh, so the, the plant has uh, mechanoreceptors and, and we'll feed back in and we'll see what's happening. And so the central nervous system can see what the signal was going to the motor uh, muscles and what, how the muscles acted, uh, the stretch receptors, joint receptors, and things like that. There's a paucity of stretch receptors in the diaphragm, but there are stretch receptors in the lung, pulmonary stretch receptors. The other aspect of the comparison of afferents is uh, the controlled variables, the blood changes in blood gases, which are perceived by the peripheral chemoreceptors, which you know are the carotid body. And um, in animals, uh, they have a, a set of vagal chemoreceptors uh, in the aortic arch and in the abdomen of all places. And then um, the other thing, so you have these comparisons and you have the controller actually gating when the when these afferents get in and it, and uh, so there's essentially a modulation and uh, then there are other aspects of uh, the modulation that can be direct or the synaptic scaling of the terminations of the afferent input. So that what I'm trying to show here is really that there are tremendous feedback mechanisms, including from the pattern generator itself. Now, this doesn't appear to be so prevalent in the cardiovascular system. The, um, the mechanoreceptor feedbacks, the barrel receptors certainly are a feedback, but they're not, there doesn't appear to be a lot of collateral coming from the areas that control um, the cardiovascular system, which, uh, as you know, is the vagus for sure and um, the, RVL, the RVLM in, in terms of sympathetic nerve activity and vascular resistance. Those uh, neurons do not seem to have uh, collaterals that feed to other areas of the brain stuff. So this is in animals. This is what I'm used to looking at. This is not in humans. They, they put a retrograde label, a label on the contralateral side of the brain stem. And you know that uh, the diaphragm is innervated by two phrenic nerves, and the chest wall is innervated by uh, two sets of intercostal uh, nerves. And the, it's not surprising then that the central pattern generator is represented bilaterally. So, but and there's a lot of commissural fibers, fibers that cross the mid lane, mid lane, mid line, and uh, innervate the contralateral side and coupling these two receptors. So when you put a label in it uh, and then look for the cells that were uh, retrogradely labeled. It is dramatic how uh, this defines a lateral column of cells going around the facial motor nucleus and uh, proceeding rostrally up into the dorsolateral ponds and the intensity of the staining in the dorsolateral ponds is, is remarkable. So 5, 5N is a trigeminal nerve coming in and um, uh, so the, 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 the and then seven is the facial motor nerve exiting the, the brain stem. 
So the facial nucleus, you may recall from your neuroanatomy, uh, is right on the border between the pond and the medulla in the caudal region and the pond in the rostral region. This is the uh, ventral surface here where the chemoreceptors, uh, a set of chemoreceptors that are parafacial uh, are down in this area, very small cells. These may not be the chemoreceptors themselves. The, the chemoreceptors uh, are, are much closer to the ventral surface uh, and it's our small units. Okay. So then this is uh, things that are the labeled key nuclei here in terms of uh, what, what uh, we have in the respiratory system uh, from the retrotrapezoid, which would be over in this region to the ventral uh, facial uh, nucleus. The BC stands for the Betzinger complex. And uh, the Betzinger complex were, was originally described uh, and presented at a meeting by Gene Merrill, uh, uh, a person who was born in Amarillo, Texas, but lived in London and had a very obnoxious English accent. For, and, uh, but it's a very bright guy. And uh, he, uh, but at the same time, he was a pretty self-serving guy. And nobody wanted to name the cells that he described here, which were expiratory neurons, which could not project down the spinal cord and which innervated many other regions of this respiratory nuclei after Gene Merrill. And they were drinking Betziger wine and they decided to uh, uh, name uh, the, the complex the Betziger complex. And uh, to give you an idea of how obnoxious Gene Merrill is, uh, he was uh, good at making electrical devices and uh, he sold to the Iranians uh, nuclear triggering devices in the 90s and uh, when he had left science by that time. But that, that's a pretty, pretty incredible guy, if you ask me. And I think he was kicked out of Britain for that. Then um, the pre-Betzinger complex is right behind him. This is the area that has been studied extensively and you read about it. And you, if you're into neuroanatomy, you realize that this is the rostral area and how could the pre-Betzinger complex be uh, placed behind the Betzinger complex, the more caudal region. And uh, Jeff Smith named this, we have really obnoxious people in control of genes. Jeff Smith, Smith named this because as far as respiratory control people are concerned, the center of their universe is, is a very clear marking on the dorsal surface of the medulla. The, the calamus scriptoris, which we call the obex. The obex is actually located slightly rostral to the calamus scriptoris. But um, anyways, the bottom line is you get to the pre-Betzinger complex before the Betzinger complex if you go from the obex. It, it's, it's really quite an amusing story. So um, this is uh, the regions in terms, this is a, uh, may, uh, uh, Albert Berger did this. He was an engineer and he published this as new in a series of three papers in the New, new England Journal of, uh, of uh, Medicine. And uh, he, in 1977, and he showed what uh, transections at different levels of the brainstem resulted in with uh, whether or not the vagi were intact or cut. This is actually, uh, you can't believe the history of uh, that is involved in this, this simple experiment. Uh, probably the results were originally described by uh, Markwald uh, in 1868, but uh, Stella in 1938 had to reestablish what Markwald wrote in 1868. Bottom line is that with, if the Bay Gy are intact, you can separate the ponds from the medulla and you, your uh, breathing pattern um, seems to be okay. And if you, uh, but if you exclude it, or include this area in the preserved sections, the, the, there's a tremendous difference between whether the vagi are intact or cut. And, and this is a little misleading because people have since sort of thought that this is uh, gasping and not necessarily uh, the, the three-phase pattern of respiration. 
and uh, this is just inspirator, inspiration and expiration with a key set of neurons becoming inspiratory neurons. I'll get into that a little bit later. But the idea is this is where the standing was when Kingman uh, joined, uh, joined the, the division. And then, but what happened? So you go back from this. Uh, the, Jeff Smith, this is adapted, but Jeff, I, I use this to show that now this is the rostral end. All, all the slides I showed up till now had the rostral end up on the left and the uh, caudal end on the right. This, uh, this is again, is them making you think and putting the rostral end uh, on the right. And the vestibular complex and the pre vestibular complex. So um, uh, this is just to show the sections what uh, in close up of what regions are theoretically contained in uh, the slice that I'm about that Jeff Smith developed with with Jack Feldman. Um, this is the rostral and caudal nucleus ambiguous. This is the rostral VRG. The ventral respiratory groups are premotor groups that send their axons down the spinal cord. This is the Betzinger complex, which is uh, has, contains expiratory neurons that uh, are, are proprio-bulbar, meaning they don't their axons don't leave the brain stem and project down the spinal cord. And this is the seven, the mononucleus of the facial nerve. Okay, so this is I, I now you can see why I put that other slide in. Uh, this is again showing uh, the rostral side to to the left and the caudal side uh, to the right, and, and as you can see the um, uh, structures uh, labeled. This is superior olive, but uh, lateral reticular nucleus. This is uh, really just showing the ice the section. So what they did is they took a vibratome and section uh, between uh, air, layers off the brainstem, and then uh, re by, while recording the hypoglossal uh, nerve or the phrenic nerve. And uh, if they went from rostral to caudal. Uh, they came down and they showed that they could disrupt the pattern uh, in, in slices here. And then if you went to 10 and 11, you got nothing in the phrenic nerve. If you went in the other direction, Ted, they did from the caudal to what? Ted, let me, let me just, you know, sure. many of the people here have no background in, in neuro stuff. This is, a, this, is, this is important, but when you say microtone, they're going to slice this from so, 1 to 11 and record at the same time. So yeah, just wanted to emphasize that. Yeah, this is a real, well, you know, this is a, a really quite an heroic uh, experiment because uh, they, the vibratome works by vibrating the tissue and uh, against a very sharp blade and so that you can, you can make a clean cut. And so they have to mount it and then take it off and set up the recording electrodes and then remount it. And, um, and so you have to keep the tissue viable for, for during that whole thing, well oxygenated and, and um, uh, you know. So the next one shows uh, the, the traces, how they set it up the slice. These, this is a 500 micron thick slice. They can get the slice down to 350 microns. You don't really care about those details. But the idea is that they're recording now in this slice from the hypoglossal uh, neuron, which has a, a slightly different pattern than the phrenic. It has a sharp onset and it's sort of a decrementing pattern. And the idea is that it comes on uh, uh, slightly before the phrenic nerve, which has a gradual rise and a sharp decline. And then it opens up the upper airway, stabilizes the upper airway, and uh, facilitates inspiration by reducing um, airway um, resistance. Now, uh, in in humans, if you look at Sam Kuna's and recordings and stuff like that, uh, it's present, but it's not as dramatic as it is in the slices I showed here. 
um, the, the, uh, the idea is that there's nothing other than this slice producing this rhythm. There's no afferent inputs. There's no other inputs from the areas of the central nervous system. There is a high level of excitability because they put a lot of potassium in the bath more than you have extracellular in, in um, your plasma, in your, art, in your CSF. But that they felt was okay because it just increases the tonic level of excitation. And these are, they identified the cells that were critical here. And, and this is sort of fascinating to me. This is, um, uh, they conjugated the uh, uh, substance P, which these cells had substance P receptors, which are also known as NK1 receptors. And uh, the supporin, the, S, the substance P would bind to the cells expressing these receptors, which you see over in the control side. And then the saporin would kill these cells uh, and selectively deplete them from the brain stem. You can see how clean this, this lesion is. And uh, if it's almost like if you didn't stain for uh, the NK1 receptors, you wouldn't realize that there was a lesion here. And, and so this is uh, what is fascinating about this is th these are in, in animals that are... Uh, that essentially were allowed to survive the uh, surgery, and this uh, this saporin uh, destroyed these cells over a period of days. And uh, this is the ultimate uh, on the, towards the end, and you can see the breathing. This is the control animal, and this is the animal that has a bilateral pre complex lesions, and you can see that the breathing pattern is ataxic. It doesn't really respond well to increases in CO2, and um, it doesn't, uh, or to 100% O2, which is the, uh, another piece of history, but uh, I'll, I'll spare you that story. And, uh, but it really shows that, man, this area must be really critical for the generation of the breathing pattern, and I wouldn't disagree with that. This is uh, really what I wanted to show you is, is this is the, the demise of the animal. You can't live with this kind of a breeding pattern. And so this, but it takes time for that kind of a breeding pattern to develop. And what I found fascinating about this paper is that they were able uh, to re uh, record state um, and with EEG electrodes, so they were chronically instrumented. So this is a pre-injection animal where they have wakefulness, non-REM, and REM sleep. The breathing pattern doesn't look as disrupted as I would have expected it for REM, but it is uh, uh, clearly REM sleep because the neck EMG becomes atonic. And the EEG has a low, uh, high frequency, low amplitude waveform. Um, then on the sixth day post-injection, you see that the, an apnea develops, a prolonged apnea develops in REM sleep. It's not present in non-REM sleep, and it's, it's certainly not present during wakefulness. It's, it's present here. And um, then it develops on the eighth day, it be, the apnea becomes even longer, and uh, arousal occurs uh, to uh, stop the apnea. This is almost, one could argue, a model of, of sleep apnea, or, or REM specific, or, or central, uh, what we call would refer to as central apneas, and then ten days post lesion, you have uh, essentially ataxic breathing, and they don't show an episode of REM, uh, but they're presumably that, that when the animal stops breathing totally, and then the episode that they have it. This is, I think, fascinating in showing that. Um, a, the idea that you have to have, uh, uh, I don't think this is underlying all central apneas by a long shot. Uh, this is just a, uh, a proof of principle experiment that this facilitation or, or uh, hampering of central drive uh, can produce these apneas. The, uh, so uh, yeah, I wanted to stop here because that, is my end of the presentation. It's a pretty convincing argument that this, at least this area is involved in generation of breathing patterns and whether or not it's because it has these 
uh, cells with pacemaker type qualities is um, is up for grabs. I mean, it, it certainly uh, is embedded in the network, as you'll see uh, in the next slide, the next group of slides. So if you have questions, I'll be happy to take a few. Is, is this uh, particular point conserved evolutionarily through across, you know, non-primates? So that's oh, good, uh, great, or non-mammals even. They're not so, mammals. Yeah. So <laughs> that that's a great question. Now, right. first of all, uh, dolphins are the uh, really sort of fascinating breathers, um, and uh, they're considered mammals, aren't they? Yep. Yeah, and you uh, have to be, yeah, I have to be long about it, Ted. Just okay. So yes, the simple answer is the frog. Uh, the frog has uh, this kind of structure, even though it doesn't have a diaphragm. All right. Okay. Okay. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay. Then, uh, so this is this is the opposite. This is showing um, a net uh, development of a network model. This is a stylistic uh, you know, diaphragm. Activity, the crescendo, a, 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 a sharp shut off, and then this, what was referred to when I, uh, in the 1980s, as post inspiratory inspiratory activity in the diaphragm. This was uh, the thought to prevent a rapid uh, or complete uh, emptying of the uh, lungs and, and slow the emptying down during the early part of expiration. And this is just showing a classic inspiratory augmenting cell and a classic expiratory uh, augmenting cell that uh, even if, and it sort of is fascinating, the, the abdominal expiratory motor neurons are not being recruited in this period of time. This is all due associated with um, expiration as you know it in terms of being uh, um, not a motor event as um, per se, as much as it is the elastic recoil of the lungs. Okay, so th um, as you can see, these cells don't overlap in activity patterns. They have, uh, when inspiratory activity begins, uh, the expiratory cells already turned off. And when uh, inspiratory cell ends, the expiratory cell has yet to begin. So they got to be, so then there were, are these uh, this is the three phases of respiration as it's come to describe uh, the inspiratory cell uh, augmenting the decrementing E cell, which is a, referred to as post inspiratory cell. Its peak activity occurs right after inspiration. And this is a model that was put forward in the late 1980s by John Remmers and Diet Helm Richter, and it still persists today. Uh, in terms of our under, uh, three phase rhythm of respiration. And you can see inhibitory connections predominate um, the interaction amongst cells. And then there still was a problem with the idea that the inspiration, the expiration shuts off before the inspiration begins. Something must be doing that. And um, th there are two factors this could be related to. Uh, accumulation of calcium inside the cell and uh, calcium uh, given adaptation, spike adaptation properties, or uh, it could be an active uh, activity of an, inhib of an inhibitory cell that inhibited the E neurons, but excited the um, inspiratory neurons. And uh, the pre-inspiratory cells have been described. They're not as prevalent as you would want them to be, but then again, when you record from neurons, you record generally from the largest neurons because they produce the strongest signal. Uh, and that's sort of, you're, you're limited for that reason. And at the same side, there, there were late inspiratory cells that were thought to be critical for in the termination of inspiration. Here, the calcium dependent properties, uh, membrane properties in the inspiratory neurons are stronger and uh, better described than they are for the expiratory neurons. So um, there's spike adaptation and uh, calcium dependence uh, cessation of activity. 
So these these have all been recorded. These cells of all types have all been recorded in the brainstem. What is sort of interesting is even though we have these nuclei that we attribute to certain types of activity cells, these cells are all intermixed, really. They're just a prevalence. It's probably based mostly on if you inject glutamate in there, what's the response you get. So, um, but what I want to show here is these cells, these maps can get quite complex. And uh, Bruce Lindsay uh, pioneered uh, with um, uh, Roger Shannon and Kendall Morris, these arrays of recording electrodes where you could record up to 100 cells simultaneously. And as a consequence of such ambitious experiments, you'll get these complex uh, wiring diagrams of the network. And all I really want to show is that the pre betzinger here is critical. They have inspiratory uh, decorating cells and you have eye drivers which drive the um, uh, motor neurons in the uh, spinal cord. Where is the thing? Okay. And this no gain in this model sort of is, was my old pet peeve, but I could have eliminated that thing. Okay. So, um, and then, so that's like a network. And then with, I love these experiments. I, we, I did them with uh, Matthias Duchman. When you, even though we consider locomotion uh, driven by a central pattern generator for locomotion, you know, you learn to walk, right? And and do you learn to breathe? So this is uh, looking at two uh, um, prep. Well, this is looking at initially at a preparation of the of what we call the in situ preparation, uh, which is a perfused brainstem spinal cord in the in, a, in the cranium, and uh, the muscles are intact. The uh, uh, afferent input is intact. It generates a nice three-phase pattern. And what you see here is the uh, phrenic nerve activity being generated by a, a rat that's uh, P19. These animals are limited in how they get their oxygen. It's all diffusion properties. It's oxygenated artificial CSF that they're being perfused with. And um, and only their brain stems are there. So the, the idea is they are not sentient to pain. Uh, so um, the point here is that when you do lung inflation, which normally in these preparations, the lungs are deflated because they're not getting oxygen or anything from the lungs, you can uh, begin to in, in, you do the lung inflation trial at a faster speed than what the breathing pattern can attain. And you can see that when it comes back, it's at this increased respiratory rate. And this increased respiratory rate even persists in the post-stimulus trial uh, period. And then if you look at it closely, the, just as one would expect, the lung inflation would uh, terminate inspiration. And um, lung inflation, as described by Herring Breuer in 1868, was that you it inhibits um, inspiration, but it act, uh, prolongs expiration. Or act, uh, it's inspiratory, disfacilatory, and, and expiratory, facilitatory. And then you can see that when the breathing returns, respiration returns, every, a lung, every inspiratory burst is terminated by lung inflation. And, and that's shown down here in the blow up. If you uh, go and look at the seventh trial. First, you'll see that there's a persistence in the increase in respiratory rate. There were uh, minutes between trials, five minutes between trials at least. And uh, But what you can see that when the lung inflation begins, uh, now the lung inflation is occurring, uh, the, the bursting is occurring between lung inflations. In other words, the central nervous system has learned that the lung inflation will come at a certain time and it's bursting between. And this is just showing the um, increase in rate. Now, the lung inflation is harder, is hard to say when exactly is lung inflation affecting the pattern generator. And this is doing the same protocol in a P19 rat 
with uh, vagal stimulation. And you can see clearly that the vagal stimulation doesn't start. Uh, here, the animals learn to terminate its inspiration prior to the next vagal stimulation. Now, this is a P19 animal. If you do it in a younger animal, than the P10 animal, they never learn, which I find rats are born very immature. And, um, and so I find this really fascinating that, that, that on a 10th vagal stimulation trial, it goes on. This, uh, it, the breathing pattern is, uh, doesn't learn and is terminated by the vagal stimulation. And this is the difference between P19 and P10 is this critical period in these rats. They're born very immature and around day 12 to day 14, um, they have tremendous changes in the receptor components, uh, including the GABA receptor. You, you may be familiar that in very young animals, GABA is an excitatory neurotransmitter, not an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And it, it, uh, this is sort of a property of the network, uh, on the, um, which I sort of find fascinating. And you can see that when the trial ends, the respiratory rate doesn't increase as much. But uh, by the 10th trial, there is a higher respiratory rate than there is in the original. And so uh, what we tried to show is that you need to have the colicor fusae or the dorsolateral ponds uh, in order for this animal to learn. And we uh, injected isobuvazine or AP5, which is a blocks excitation, uh, blocks a ga GABA receptor subtype and causes a sort of an amnustic pattern of breathing that you, the, the vagi essentially are intact, but they're not innervating lungs that are being inflated periodically. So you get an amnustic type breathing pattern. And in these animals, again, the, you can't, it's sort of light, but the vagal stimulation uh, terminates the apneustic breathing pattern. And, and they don't learn to, um, uh, to breathe in between vagal stimuli. Now, and I want to sort of end here because I, I thought this was an incredible experiment. So this is an uh, infant that was uh, instrumented um, because he's a high risk for SID. And uh, this is the fatal event. It's, it's unbelievable. And um, so the, the infant's breathing along and then it just it stops breathing and there are a few gasps and, and it dies. And alarms are going off. People are trying to resuscitate this baby and it's not being resuscitated. But what is fascinating to, to me is the fact that this is, uh, uh, seems to be a, a precipitated by a precipitous fall in heart rate that just eventually uh, goes very, very low. Hey, Pitt, so, I want to clarify, that's not tachycardia in an infant. So, so but that is definite bradycardia. But yeah. that, that heart rate no, no. is Infants have a high rate of, yeah. of heart rate. Right. It's not tachycardia. Did I say tachycardia? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, no, they have a high rate and, and uh, they have a high respiratory rate. And then it, it, it bradycardia come, precipitates. And then what is more fascinating is that you, this, the, so you take, this is not the neural anatomy of this infant, but this is the neural anatomy of infants that have our SIDS cases. And this, this is forms the basis of a lot of funding, NIH funding to Hannah Kenny. And essentially, uh, you can see that the ser RAFE serotonergic neurons in a control case are, have a lot of 5-HT1A receptors. And you can see that the RAFE and the serotonergic receptors, uh, the RAFE are on the midline. And, uh, but they have extensions of least or fibers going out laterally. And this is in the, in the medulla or rostral medulla. And then uh, the, uh, there's an absence of these receptors and presumably this is an autoreceptor. And so the absence of serotonergic neurons here 
uh, in in the SIDS case. Now, I can tell you that the that the this is a particularly dramatic ex examples. The 5-HT cells in SIDS um, are in, theoretically immature, but are still present in the SIDS cases, but um, and but not well developed. And uh, it, it it's a fascinating thing. I can understand. And it's sort of saying, like, I'm focused on the control of respiration, but I did show you that slide earlier showing the, the um, association between the cardiorespiratory uh, and uh, the cardiorespiratory systems control. And this also emphasizes, uh, I think, that that it, focusing on just control of respiration is, is sort of misled, can be too narrow a focus. So, this is uh, a good place to stop. The definitions that you'll see is rhythm, is timing, and uh, so you talk about respiratory rhythm, most people are talking about the timing. When you talk about respiratory pattern, it includes the timing, but also the amplitude of uh, the motor neuronal uh, neurons recruited and activated. And then what um, Frank Ducono and I study are the dynamics of the repetitive cycles, and I, I'm really interested in the coupling with other rhythms. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, thank you, uh, De Denise, right, for cor correcting me when I said tachycardia on this slide. Okay, no, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>